Dive with us into the fascinating world of biographies, histories, and speeches as we learn from the words of the past. Chapter 1 of Martin Luther by Carl E. Koppenhauer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elise J. Wood Chapter 1. The Miner's Son Eisleben to Erfurt The Turk was slashing his way up the valley of the Danube into the heart of Europe. God sat far off, not as a loving father, but as a vengeful law court judge, inflicting all sorts of misery on mankind. In the forest lurked witches and demons, seeking to drag the unwary to destruction. Into such a world threatened by the sword, ruled by fear, and plagued by superstition, Martin Luther was born on November 10th, 1483, in Eisleben, Germany. Within such a world he became a man disdainful of bodily harm, convinced of God's love and mercy, endowed with abundant common sense, a Christian worthy of study and emulation. Although his station of birth was lowly, greatness sought him out, and the whole world has felt the impact of his life. The Luther child was baptized in the church of St. Peter the morning after his birth, and was named Martin for the saint of the day. His parents, Hans and Margareta Luther, were simple, industrious folk. They had moved recently from the farming community of Mura, home of the Luther family, to Eisleben, where Hans hoped to make his fortune in the copper mines. When Martin was about six months old, the family moved to nearby Mansfeld. The first years there were hard and it was with difficulty that Hans scraped together money to send his son to school. By the time Martin was thirteen, however, his father was able to send him to a school conducted by the Brothers of the Common Life at Magdeburg. As was the custom, he earned his board by singing and begging from door to door with one of the school choirs. He stayed in Magdeburg for only a year, and then was sent to the parish school of St. George in Eisenach. While again earning his keep by singing and begging, he became acquainted with Frau Ursula Cotta, a woman of culture and refinement, who took the promising young scholar into her home. Hans Luther had been working diligently, and by the time his son was seventeen, the family budget permitted his entrance to the University of Erfurt. Martin worked diligently, too, and at the end of four years had passed not only his bachelor's, but his master's examinations. INTO THE CLOISTER Obedient to his father's wishes, Martin Luther, on May twentieth. 1505, began his postgraduate studies at Erfurt, preparatory to entering the field of law. But after studying for only a few weeks, he suddenly rejected the whole idea and applied for admission at the town's Augustinian monastery. Hans Luther was terribly angry, and Martin's university friends were astounded. Why had he taken such a step? Many factors contributed. But in the final analysis his decision to become a monk can be summed up in the words religious experience. His parents were God-fearing people, whose piety undoubtedly had an early influence upon him. He shared fear of the horrors of hell, purgatory, and the last judgment, which was common to people at the close of the Middle Ages. In the university library he found a complete Bible and was tremendously impressed with his own ignorance of its contents. He attended church and daily chapel devotions regularly all through school. His introspective nature made him starkly aware of his sins and shortcomings. Life as a monk was held to be the best way to forgiveness and heaven. Several grim incidents increased his anxiety. 
while on a holiday from the university he accidentally severed an artery in his leg with his student sword he almost bled to death and in distress prayed to the virgin mary for help the death of a number of students during a plague moved him profoundly while returning to erfurt following a visit to mansfeld he was caught in a heavy thunderstorm and a bolt of lightning struck so close that he was knocked to the ground he invoked saint anna for aid and vowed help me and i will become a monk fifteen days later on july seventeenth friends accompanied him to the gate of the black cloister monastery of the order of augustinian hermits in erfurt that this decision came later in life than usually was the case and that his impressionable years had been spent not within the confines of a monastery but in the unrestricted atmosphere of a great university later proved valuable to him and to the protestant church monk and priest luther was not received immediately into the monastery but had to remain for several months in the monastic hostelry examining himself and being examined in september fifteen o five all parties being satisfied his head was shaved and he was invested with the black augustinian habit and cowl and formally received as a novice he scrubbed the floors begged in the streets and engaged in various ascetic and spiritual exercises when his probationary year was ended luther took the vows of obedience poverty and chastity and was received into the order of the augustinian monks his sincere piety and scholarship so impressed his superiors that he was urged to prepare for the priesthood and on april fourth fifteen o seven was ordained to that office the petty employments of the monastery did not consume all of luther's energy and he devoted himself strenuously to studying the scholastic theology available at that time however long hours with books did little to ease his mind and give him the peace of conscience that he sought within the cloister walls the books taught him to rely on his own efforts to procure favor with god and he was too honest to believe that his penitence was deep enough and his fastings worthy enough to compensate for his sins although his heart was not at rest luther continued to perform his priestly duties and undertake any new tasks assigned to him in the fall of fifteen o eight he was appointed to the chair of moral philosophy which had been entrusted to the augustinians by the faculty at the newly established university of wittenberg desiring to teach theology rather than logic and ethics he availed himself of this opportunity to study for a bachelor's degree which would permit him to lecture on certain books of the bible he had virtually completed his studies when he was called back to erfurt in october fifteen o nine there he lectured in the monastery for about a year and in november fifteen ten was sent in company with another monk on a mission to rome in the holy city he visited as many shrines and churches as possible his high opinion of the papal court was lowered by his observations of its reckless luxury and scandal but his confidence in the church remained unshaken the professor dr luther luther returned to erfurt from rome and in the summer of fifteen eleven was sent as one of the three new professors to wittenberg here he came under the influence of john von staupitz vicar of the augustinian order who showed warm sympathy and understanding toward the earnest young priest as yet luther had been unable to convince himself of god's love mercy and forgiveness his quest carried him along the path of good works but he never could feel that he had done enough to save himself he tried the path of confession but concluded that there was more wrong with men than could be cleansed by enumerating a list of particular offences 
luther's problems of faith did not mount up through clearly defined stages to a sudden soul-free climax rather he passed through a series of crises staupitz did much to comfort him in some of these grave periods he encouraged the zealous monk to trust in the god who loved and sent his son to redeem man rather than to try to appease god through his own works staupitz's theology was quite different from luther's it admitted man's weakness and called him to completely submerge himself in god there was no striving no assertion of self eventually the individual found peace in a blissful atmosphere surrounded entirely by god luther's efforts were virtually the opposite his every act was replete with self-assertion directed toward winning merit he tried the mystical way of staupitz but could never completely lose himself in the essence of a god whom he conceived to be an angry judge luther's troubled spirit did not lower him in the vicar's estimation and perhaps to get his mind off it staupitz advised him to study for a doctor's degree and assume the chair of bible at the university it was good medicine for thus the distressed monk came to closer grips with the source book of his faith so far writings about the bible rather than the book itself had been his main diet he studied for the degree and preached in the monastery's rickety chapel until october eighteenth and nineteenth of fifteen twelve when he became martin luther doctor of sacred scripture professor of bible at wittenberg university the awakening since may fifteen twelve luther had been sub-prior and regent in the school connected with the black cloister at wittenberg in may fifteen fifteen he became district vicar for thuringia and meissen and having eleven monasteries under his care meanwhile he was discharging his duties as professor in the university frequently the solution to great problems comes quite undramatically as one goes about the daily tasks luther's awakening to a god who makes man righteous in order to save him came in such a way he knew the teaching that the righteous shall be saved by faith but who he asked himself is righteous as he studied and taught and looked after his wards in the monasteries he gradually discovered he had been misled by the medieval concept that grace could be earned this he found was contrary to the new testament grace can't be earned god gives it man therefore does not make himself righteous it is god who makes the man righteous he makes man righteous as a free gift grace so that he can be saved out of this came the doctrine of justification by faith at this point luther still felt that he was in total agreement with the teaching of the roman church in a humble way he believed that he had discovered for himself what had always been that he had just been slow in catching on deeper study however made it clear to him that there was a great difference between his own and the theology of the middle ages he became convinced that man can contribute nothing towards his salvation but that god recognizing man's unrighteousness had redeemed him and restored him through the sacrifice of his son jesus christ this indeed was not the work of an implacable judge but of a loving father luther now found himself rejecting most of the medieval writers and teachers he went back to the bible to christ and the apostles convinced of the truth he no longer was restrained by contradictory views his beliefs were contrary to many of the teachings of the church 
and while he didn't plan it that way they brought him into open revolt the matter of indulgences opened the battle collision with rome the question of indulgences the roman church taught that forgiveness of sins could be secured only through the sacrament of penance this required contrition of heart confession to a priest and satisfaction by good works release from the penalty of eternal punishment was guaranteed by the absolution pronounced by the priest if not enough works of penance were done before death however the remainder had to be atoned for in the torments of purgatory for an indefinite period gradually a custom developed which permitted one to purchase indulgences to offset purgatorial punishment it was at this point that luther's theology conflicted with the church's practice grace was god's gift but indulgences implied that man can earn grace in 1515 the sale of indulgences was being pressed in the archbishopric of mainz which had been purchased recently by albert of brandenburg because of the vast revenues the office controlled it was a profitable investment to become a bishop in those days although not old enough to be a bishop albert already had procured two other sees before negotiating for the purchase of mainz pope leo x was willing to overlook these irregularities in exchange for ten thousand ducats which he needed to complete the church of st peter in rome albert borrowed the money from the fuggers banking concern in augsburg then the pope granted him the privilege of selling indulgences so that he could settle his account at the bank and at the same time raise additional sums for st peter's john tetzel a dominican prior who had displayed shrewd aptitude in selling indulgences conducted the campaign he didn't enter luther's parish because frederick the wise elector of saxony had an indulgence traffic of his own in the form of a large collection of relics gathered for veneration in the castle church wittenberg however some of luther's people crossed the border and bought indulgences from tetzel luther saw the fundamental danger of the traffic when these folks countered his preaching on the repentance of heart and life by showing him indulgences remitting their sins on october thirty first luther tacked a placard on the door of the castle church the sound of his hammer reached to rome the ninety five theses the theses which luther posted on the church door were not a declaration of revolt they were after the custom of the day an invitation to the theologians of wittenberg and vicinity to debate on the indulgence situation so that all participants could be prepared he posted the ninety-five propositions he intended to defend in the debate the points for argument did not call for abandonment of indulgences but merely advocated the elimination of evils in the system luther maintained in his theses that repentance should be a lifelong experience and should manifest itself in a continuing effort to overcome sinful desires indulgences he said are simply remissions of penalties which the church has imposed they have no effect on the souls of the departed and they don't remit sin only god can do that luther believed he was being a loyal defender of the roman church by attempting to correct these abuses and correspondence revealed that he thought the pope was unaware of what was going on to his surprise the theses released a great flood of favorable public opinion and were applauded as a courageous and unrelenting attack within two weeks they were distributed in german as well as latin throughout germany there had been a growing dislike of the indulgence system and of the pope's interference in what to the germans 
were strictly their own national affairs the theses now became a rallying point not only for those who opposed rome's continuous exploitation of german finances but also for those who resented the dominating attitude of a foreign power even though they attacked one of his own pet institutions the elector frederick stood by his daring young monk as the augustinians rallied around luther the dominicans upheld the cause of brother tetzel he was granted a doctor's degree largely to enable him to publish some theses of his own when the tetzel writings came off press and were distributed students at Wittenberg collected a large quantity and held a public bonfire luther still a loyal son of the monastic system was greatly displeased by their sophomoric act rome moves to attack luther sent a copy of his theses to albert of brandenburg who forwarded them to rome where pope leo x reportedly brushed the incident off as a row between rival monastic orders later the dominicans charged luther with heresy and formal proceedings were begun on august seventh fifteen eighteen luther received notice to appear in rome for trial within sixty days by no means a coward luther was none the less unwilling to be the victim of a mock trial in the territory of the enemy he asked elector frederick to have the trial transferred to german soil where he might at least have the benefit of impartial judges on second thought the pope decided not to wait sixty days and ordered the elector to arrest luther at once and turn him over to cardinal cogeton for delivery in rome although frederick was not sympathetic to heresy he was determined that the man who had brought so much attention to his university at wittenberg should have fair play he prevailed upon the pope to give cardinal cogeton give luther a personal hearing in augsburg where he would be attending a diet or parliament in a benign manner the cardinal offered to help luther out of all his difficulty if he would simply submit to the pope's authority and retract his errors luther of course refused and tried to defend his positions a fruitless and oft-times heated controversy ensued and at the end of three days cajetan told luther to leave his presence and not return until he was ready to recant the cardinal was quite upset by the augsburg incident and wrote elector frederick a letter calling upon him to turn the heretical monk over to the roman authorities frederick's reply indicated his increasing resistance to papal dictatorship he asked for a free trial and a statement of luther's errors in writing the pope's chamberlain karl von miltitz was dispatched to germany in an attempt to rectify cajetan's blundering he correctly estimated that much of the populace was on luther's side and the time for forcibly suppressing him was past resorting to diplomacy he persuaded luther to have his case submitted to a german bishop and to refrain from further attack in the meantime luther agreed but only on the condition that his opponents would remain silent too the breach widens pushed into the arena even while luther was meeting with miltitz circumstances were shaping up which drove him to break silence he had stated his willingness to recant if someone proved his error an ambitious professor at the university of ingolstadt john eck with an enviable reputation as a disputant saw in this his opportunity to win renown and also favor with rome andrew karlstadt of the wittenberg faculty had espoused the cause of luther publicly and had been engaged in an extended debate with eck through the medium of pamphlets now a public debate between the two was arranged for leipzig in preparation eck drew up a series of twelve theses 
directed not so much at his differences with Karlstadt as with the theology of Luther. The champion of Roman orthodoxy clearly was baiting Luther into the arena. After months of wrangling about procedures and proper invitations, and with much pomp and pageantry, the debate got under way on June twenty seventh, fifteen nineteen. Several hundred Wittenberg students were there, a sixteenth century sort of college cheering section. During the ensuing eighteen days of debate, they frequently became embroiled with the Leipzig University students who sided with Eck. Karlstadt and Eck matched wits for four days over the relation between grace and free will. The erudition and cleverness of Eck gave him a decided advantage over the Wittenberg scholar, but spectator interest was being reserved for July 4th, when Luther would take the field. For another four days Eck and Luther discussed the divine right of the Pope, with Ingolstadter insisting that the divine plan of government was a monarchy with the Pope at its head. Luther agreed that the Church was a monarchy, but that Christ was its head. The passage in St. Matthew concerning the rock upon which Christ would build his Church was quoted by Eck with the interpretation that Peter was the rock, and since he also was the first Pope, it was clear that papal supremacy had been established by christ luther declared the passage should be considered along with peter's previous statement thou art the christ this confession he said is the rock on which christ built his church the shadow of hus the crisis at Leipzig was reached when Eck backed into a dialectical corner and had to resort to foul tactics. How to discredit Luther? Perhaps if he made him synonymous with heresy? Craftily Eck pointed out the similarity between Luther's arguments and those of the Bohemian reformer John Hus, whom the Council of Constance had condemned to the stake a century before. Luther denounced the insinuation and declared the Bohemian heresy irrelevant to the debate. It was inevitable in opposing the Roman Church's contention to primacy that Luther would use arguments similar to those of previous reformers. The condemnation of Hus as a heretic did not necessarily make all of his views heretical. In fact, Luther insisted, some of Hus's articles were genuinely Christian and evangelical. The spectators and visiting theologians were stunned, and perhaps Luther shocked even himself. Clearly his remark would be interpreted to mean that the general councils, the highest earthly authority, were not beyond fault. This was heresy. Luther had been long aware of the need for reform in the Church, as his ideas developed, it became apparent that the Pope was not above human weakness. The Church militant needed an earthly head, and for the sake of good order it was necessary that he be obeyed. But that didn't make him infallible. After all, he was human. Now this same reasoning had pushed from Luther's lips the admission that councils could err also unwittingly eck had contributed what probably was the greatest outcome of the debate luther's growing conviction that even general councils could be unreliable henceforth he would take his stand on the unassailable word of god as revealed in the scriptures results of the debate were weighed by judges at the university of paris who condemned luther and his views as heretical when Philip Melanchthon, a Wittenberg associate and close friend of Luther, questioned the opinion on the basis of Scripture, the Parisians looked down their noses at the upstart, informing him that they were chief among the few to whom interpretation of Scripture could be entrusted for such a time as this. 
luther was frankly disappointed with the outcome of the debate he had hoped his opinions would be accepted and reformation of the church effected the controversy did much however to crystallize his own views the pope did not have absolute authority a council can err in its decisions the bible is above popes and council in authority the church of christ is not limited to the roman fellowship alone but is the community of believers throughout the world gradually luther realized these views differed so fundamentally from those of rome that there was small chance of healing the breach the notion that he might become a martyr recurred frequently but it didn't cause him to relinquish his zeal in fact he received inspiration from it and kept three presses rolling at full speed to turn out tracts sermons and commentaries in addition to the leipzig debate the summer of fifteen nineteen brought forth another event which was significant in luther's life maximilian the holy roman emperor died in january and the election of a successor was of utmost concern to the rulers and populace of europe consequently there was rejoicing in germany on june twenty eighth when the electors named charles of spain in preference to francis of france charles was a habsburg and the germans confidently expected he would unite them into a strong independent nation however the new emperor favored his spanish mother more than his german father and treated his fatherland like an outlying province of spain wide distribution of the ninety-five theses and other writings as well as prominence resulting from the leipzig encounter had fixed the eyes of many germans upon luther when charles failed to step into the role of national figure they switched their enthusiasm to luther few understood his ideas on christianity but they believed he could lead them to political intellectual and economic freedom scholars princes knights and commoners gathered about the wittenberg professor who had demonstrated his fearlessness in the face of tyranny gradually luther sensed his mission as leader in a mighty movement history called it the reformation luther explains himself the christian nobility luther's attempts to interest the pope in reform had proved futile he was likewise unsuccessful in having a general council convened to consider his propositions now in the first of three great treatises he called upon the secular rulers to concern themselves with the state of the church appearing in august fifteen twenty the open letter to the christian nobility of the german nation flatly attacked corruption among the clergy and prodded laity into doing something about it since all christians are priests before god luther held it was incumbent upon them and particularly upon christian rulers to feel responsible for the conduct of the church within their domains as christians they should abhor vice and wickedness regardless of whether it flourished on the main street or in the monastery no one said the open letter has been able to reform the romanists because they have erected three walls of defence first when pressed by the temporal power they have made decrees and said that the temporal power has no jurisdiction over them second when the attempt is made to reprove them out of the scriptures they raise the objection that the interpretation of the scriptures belongs to no one except the pope third if threatened with a council they answer with the fable that no one can call a council but the pope luther demolished the first wall by showing that every one is equal before god those holding the title of priest or bishop are not superior to other christians 
nor do they differ except in vocation by which also a cobbler differs from a blacksmith the title of priest is conferred by laymen who themselves are priests in the sight of god thus the holder of a church title is not beyond the reach of temporal government he breached the second wall by pointing out that every enlightened christian layman or priest has the right to seek god's message for him in the scriptures the third wall tumbled through luther's insistence that every man as a priest shares responsibility for right management in the church the babylonian captivity before his letter to the nobility was off the press luther was writing his second treatise the babylonian captivity of the church the first had been primarily for lay people while the second was for theologians it aimed directly at freeing the christian fellowship in europe from the captivity of the roman sacramental system the roman church taught that it alone could dispense the saving grace associated with the sacraments and that the sacramental acts could be performed only by ordained priests any one who denied that the church controlled the flow of grace from god was striking catholicism in its most vital spot without its sacramental system rome could no longer bind its subjects this was the front at which luther aimed his heaviest artillery he reiterated his views on the priesthood of believers priests should be servants of the people who comprise the church rather than servants of a papal hierarchy they cannot interfere with grace it is god's free gift to the individual believer in the course of his treatise luther also asserted that there are only two sacraments baptism and the lord's supper rather than seven as taught in roman catholicism a sacrament he held had to be instituted by christ contain a divine promise of the forgiveness of sins and make use of an earthly element water bread wine confirmation ordination marriage penance and extreme unction were rejected as sacraments because they lacked some of the prescribed characteristics the mass had been seen as a repetition of christ's incarnation and crucifixion at the hands of a priest before the altar by this sacrifice man tried to earn grace now it became the lord's supper a communion of the believing christian with his saviour both the bread and the wine should be received by the communicant luther insisted while christ is really present in the elements the bread does not become flesh nor the wine blood through a magical act called transubstantiation moreover christ is not sacrificed anew whenever the mass is celebrated his sacrifice on the cross was for all time through that sacrifice a man's sins are remitted if he has faith christian liberty miltitz the papal nuncio who previously had failed to reconcile luther and the pope tried again in october fifteen twenty he had luther agree to write a letter to leo x assuring him that there was nothing personal in his attacks on the papacy in the letter luther cautioned leo against listening to those of his advisers who would make him a demigod who put him above councils who make him the final authority in interpreting scripture for through them satan already has made much headway he also assured leo that he was an obedient servant of the church and that he was not inveighing against him personally accompanying the letter was a copy of luther's latest pamphlet a treatise on christian liberty it expresses calm christian reflection quite different from the theological conflicts which were carried forward in his other treatises at the outset it poses two propositions which seem to be a paradox 
a christian man is a perfectly free lord of all subject to none and a christian man is a perfectly dutiful servant of all subject to all the first proposition acknowledges man as a sinner but one who has been liberated and restored to a right relationship with god through justifying grace in justifying man god has freed him from the consequence of his sins because of christ's atonement this freedom affects a man's whole life not only is he free from the consequences of sin but he is no longer shackled by his own hates passions and wilful desires because this freedom is based upon his own personal relationship with god no one can interfere he is subject to none the second proposition indicates that the free man's life takes a different direction originally he was concerned with himself but now the reborn person in gratitude for his own freedom serves his neighbor his motive is not merely humanitarian but stems out of a sincere desire to help others become free too love permits him to do no less than become the servant of all the treatise and letter would have scant effect upon pope leo five months previously he had signed a bull excommunicating luther the papal bull a chronological listing of events can be misleading for instance those concerning the papal bull it was signed by leo on june fifteenth fifteen twenty it reached luther officially on october tenth he immediately wrote a fiery epistle denouncing it and eck whose style and invective he recognized aware that the bull was being circulated and that his literature was being burned he nevertheless sat down in november and wrote a friendly letter to the pope accompanying it with his treatise on christian liberty on the surface this would indicate insincerity but events shaped up to prove he was being consistent although he knew he had personal enemies he never lost sight of the fact that he was fighting a system rather than individuals the pope for him was merely a figurehead in this instance the symbol of an intolerable autocracy in an area where individual freedom before god was essential the papal bull credited luther with forty-one errors called for the burning of his books charged heresy gave him sixty days to submit and warned every one against sheltering him in his excommunication distribution of the bull was in the hands of eck and papal legate jeremy aleander they succeeded in posting copies of the bull and burning books in several cities but largely their efforts were unsuccessful due to strenuous opposition by the german people on december tenth probably in reprisal for a book burning at cologne melanchthon posted a notice on the wittenberg university bulletin board inviting students and faculty to a bonfire outside the elster gate of the city books on scholastic theology and especially those works of canon law on which the pope and the roman hierarchy based their claims to power were tossed into the flames then luther stepped forward quietly and with a prayer on his lips added the booklet containing the papal bull to the fire he and the professors withdrew but the students made a holiday of the affair parading and singing throughout the town and burning books of luther's opponents significantly the bonfire marked the end of the sixty-day period of grace from now on no one was to communicate with luther or provide him with the necessities of life in the eyes of rome he was an outlaw the monk stands firm the diet of worms overtones of intrigue and statecraft are dominant in the prelude to the imperial assembly at worms 
the church at rome had given its decision would the secular authorities now take action and turn him over to the papal authorities charles at his coronation as emperor had subscribed to the imperial constitution which said no german should be taken outside his country for trial and also that no one should be outlawed without a hearing frederick the wise luther's elector took no action against him using these same reasons as an excuse aleander the papal representative wanted the case settled arbitrarily by the emperor since he was well aware of the support luther would receive at a public hearing the man had been condemned by the church he argued and as good churchmen the rulers should simply apprehend the wittenberg monk without a further examination of his views for the first three months of fifteen twenty one the diet devoted itself chiefly to transacting state business during this period emperor charles changed his mind several times about inviting the wittenberg monk for a hearing finally on march sixth against his will he offered luther a safe conduct to worms in a two-wheeled cart luther and a few companions set out from wittenberg on april second cities along the way welcomed him and invited him to preach but no reception equalled the one on his arrival at worms when the party was sighted from the cathedral tower at ten a m on april sixteenth a group of horsemen dashed out to act as an escort through the city gate two thousand spectators thronged the streets so that luther was barely able to reach his lodging in the house of the knights of st john he was summoned to appear at four o'clock the following afternoon and because of the crowds in the streets was conducted through gardens and alleys to the episcopal palace where the diet was meeting when the door of the assembly hall was opened luther was ushered in luther was ushered through a company of princes nobles and ecclesiastics to the foot of a canopied chair on it sat charles the twenty-one-year-old emperor nearby was a table loaded with books answer without horns after the opening courtesies had been dispatched the presiding officer an official of the archbishop of trier pointed to the books asked luther if he was the author and if he was ready to retract what he had written luther had been instructed to speak only in answer to direct questions and was not to seek a discussion however this double question could not be answered yes or no he paused and his legal adviser asked that the titles be read luther then acknowledged that the books were his again the question will you retract the monk believed his writing was an accurate interpretation of god's word in his mind was christ's admonition to the disciples whosoever shall deny me before men him will i so deny before my father since salvation was involved he asked time to think over the answer the diet agreed that he should return at four the next afternoon after a night of prayer luther again appeared before the impressive assembly this time a larger hall had been chosen because of the tremendous crowd again the formalities and again the question but this time phrased a bit differently do you defend all of your books or are you willing to recall some things this was the opening luther had been seeking and he quickly shaped his strategy to take advantage of it they were forcing him to make a speech since a categorical answer was impossible the books were in three classes luther explained the first was purely devotional and had been commended even by his enemies the second was against the papacy 
if he recanted these he would open the door to further tyranny and impiety the third class inveighed against individuals and in these he admitted he had used caustic and intemperate language still the facts had to stand unless refuted by the scriptures in which case he would be first to cast his books into the fires obviously the diet could not at this moment disprove his works by the bible there was a consultation the interrogator turned to luther give us a direct answer one without horns will you or will you not recant your errors neither right nor safe the spanish guards were mentally stacking faggots around the lonely little figure in the middle of the room princes nobles and the holy roman emperor leaned forward to catch his words since your majesty and your lordships want a direct reply i will answer without horns or teeth he began quietly the spectators looked at each other significantly then back to the earnest friar confidence was returning and his voice carried plainly to all corners of the room unless convinced by the testimony of scripture or right reason for i trust neither the pope nor councils inasmuch as they have often erred and contradicted one another i am bound in conscience held captive by the word of god in the scriptures i have quoted i neither can nor will recant anything for it is neither right nor safe to act against conscience god help me amen there was silence for an instant then pandemonium broke loose the interrogator tried to restore order but the emperor walked out and the meeting adjourned luther was escorted back to his rooms by the admiring populace nobles who had been on the fringe now openly praised the courageous preacher and vowed their support during the night warning notices were surreptitiously posted on the doors of his enemies charles summoned the electors and princes the following day to decide what should be done his own impulse to condemn luther right away was restrained because he needed the good will of the germans in other measures coming before the diet a plan was evolved whereby a select group of theologians would call on luther and try to effect a reconciliation through persuasion the discussion always bogged down when luther insisted he must be persuaded on the basis of scripture having received a twenty-one day safe conduct luther set out for wittenberg on april twenty sixth the diet closed officially on may twenty fifth and the next day following a rump session of prejudiced nobles the emperor signed the edict of worms according to it luther was the devil himself in a monk's habit he was to be seized on sight and turned over to the emperor an outlaw of the church and the state drastic changes wartburg to wittenberg fortunately for luther there was more than noisy adulation among the people a few sober minds knew how relentless the papal wolves would be in tracking him down after the safe conduct expired and so a kidnapping and removal to a safe place was planned luther made a detour along the road to wittenberg in order to visit relatives at mura for months the outside world knew only that he had been captured near there in the thuringian forest by a band of knights many lamented him as dead but gradually the flow of thorny letters to his adversaries and the new treatises rolling from the press allayed their fears by a circuitous route luther had been conveyed to the wartburg an ancient fortress castle near eisenach he arrived on may fourth and with the exception of short trips into the forest and to nearby villages did not leave for seven months to outward appearances 
he was junker george a carefree bearded knight with sword swinging impressively at his side the secret was well kept and at the outset even the elector who authorized the masquerade did not know luther's whereabouts luther chafed at his forced inactivity and ever the monk fell to contemplation and examination of himself could past generations and earlier scholars have been so completely out of step with the gospel could a mere friar be right against them all might he not be in error and drag many others to eternal damnation hard work helped take his mind off his problems during his stay in the wartburg in addition to correspondence and pamphlets he authored a work on confession expositions on several psalms a commentary on the magnificat had a volume of sermons on the epistles and gospels well under way and had translated the entire new testament into german prayer and study restored his conviction to doubt or even to remain silent was like going against conscience neither right nor safe with conviction came a sense of divine commission when events called him back into the world again he went courageously and with determination he was a revolutionary but a conservative one that quality is what took him back to wittenberg from freedom to license so often a new movement suffers from over enthusiasm the reformation was no exception in this respect zealots took the usual shortcut from bondage to freedom by way of turmoil instead of restrained orderly procedure in parts of germany the old ways were thrown off hastily organs paintings and statues were thrown from the churches vestments were discarded bread and wine were both administered to the laity priests married nuns took husbands monastic vows were renounced various forms of the mass were discontinued priests and worshippers who persisted in the traditional forms were attacked rumors of violent acts reached the wartburg luther still in the guise of junker george made a hurried trip to wittenberg early in december fifteen twenty one matters there had not yet reached the unrestrained stage which they later assumed nevertheless he cautioned the people in a warning against riot and rebellion written on his return to the wartburg in it he reasoned that reform is not so much a matter of externals as of faith breaking up the furniture in a church does not change the heart of a man vandalism is by no means a sign of repentance and trust in god in fact it approaches the old form of seeking favor through works giving wine as well as bread in the lord's supper is not as important as the spiritual attitude of the communicant finally the tumult in wittenberg reached the point where he had to step in so in the face of the imperial ban he returned on march sixth fifteen twenty two insisting that no drastic change should be made until through re-education those affected requested it as a matter of faith he restored order in the university city in a remarkably short time the peasants meanwhile took the short cut to freedom too in a series of bloody uprisings chafing under their bondage to the nobles they adapted luther's free lord of all statement to their own demands for social reform luther preached the christian duty of submission to lawful authority but the peasants ravaged and plundered until finally defeated in fifteen twenty five it was a dark hour in the reformation pigtails on the pillow wittenberg june fourteenth catherine von bora twenty six late of the cistercian nunnery at nimschen and martin luther forty two professor of bible at the local university 
were married last night at a simple ceremony in the black cloister dr john bugenhagen officiated in attendance were artist lucas cronach and mrs cronach dr eustace jonas prior of castle church and john appel professor of law at the university if there had been newspapers in fifteen twenty five luther's wedding might have been announced to the public in this way however newspapers weren't to appear until much later and the lack of publicity gave gossips and slanderers choice opportunity to vilify the former monk and nun the malicious stories were partly offset by a public ceremony complete with a special service in the town church a wedding dinner in the cloister and a dance at the town hall on june twenty seventh the wedding was a direct result of luther's reform teachings he disliked the monastic system because men and women sought merit before god through restraints and vows rather than depending upon grace celibacy he had written earlier is not founded on scripture but marriage is these teachings found their way into many cloisters and convents among them the one at nimschen where cotterin von borra at age of sixteen had been received into the cistercian order she and eleven other nuns sought luther's assistance in effecting a plan of escape although he had no idea of what it would involve for him personally he arranged for them to be smuggled out of the convent in empty fish barrels on the day before easter in fifteen twenty three the plan succeeded and some of the nuns came to wittenberg where they found homes husbands or new positions two years later katia was the only one not permanently cared for despite luther's several attempts at matchmaking then the spunky miss hinted rather boldly that the reformer himself would be an acceptable husband and he resolved to take the course which he had urged on so many others it was strange for one accustomed to solitude formerly at the table i was alone he wrote now i am with some one when i awaken to see a pair of pigtails on the pillow which were not there before the cloister becomes a home marriage probably extended luther's life for a number of years previously he and his dog enjoyed an irregular sort of existence in the black cloister dishes were covered with dust the bed hadn't been made in over a year his clothes were in disorder sometimes luther forgot his meals altogether and at other times he stuffed himself the vigor with which his industrious wife established order can be imagined by his reference to her as my lord katia she was an efficient housekeeper and thrifty manager of what little they possessed at the outset neither had any money luther refused pay for his writing although the publishers grew rich nor did he receive any tax revenues from the cloister since he had laid aside his cowl things improved when the elector gave luther the cloister for a home and adjacent to it a vegetable garden with a small brew-house where katia prepared the family beverage his small salary as professor was augmented somewhat when they took in boarding students attending the university the luthers had six children two of them died in childhood but otherwise the family enjoyed a merry wholesome life the house was always full of visitors some of them more or less permanent including travelling dignitaries numerous aunts and relatives monks and nuns seeking a permanent residence and four orphaned children from among their kinsfolk because it was large and suitable the cloister sometimes was used as a hospital and it was not unusual for the family to number as many as twenty-five guests who stayed for any length of time were expected to take part in household duties participate in daily prayers catechetical study and family devotions 
through katia's economy improvements were made in the luther house an orchard hop garden and finally a farm were purchased when luther worried about his children's future he overcame it with faith a pious training is most important he wrote it is good to leave an inheritance but preparing children to manage wisely is more important we parents are fools if we don't train them to fear god to control themselves and to live honorably a church reborn the national conscience the people at wittenberg and in other cities of influence were gradually learning to think of the church as separate from the roman hierarchy now there was need for reorganization a steady supply of ministers was essential and arrangements had to be made for their training and support a bond of some sort was necessary to establish unity of endeavor and mission work was imperative in areas where conviction had lapsed into indifference luther didn't care for organizational work the thought that the new church might degenerate into a system of laws and regulations haunted him although his revised order of worship was finding its way into use he felt that still more urgent matters demanded attention proper instruction of the young and old was essential and to accomplish it there had to be some sort of oversight the bishops had neglected instruction of the laymen and the princes were loath to reinstitute it luther therefore laid the task directly upon the congregations and in some cases the city councils to select competent men as pastors establish pastoral districts and set up schools to advise and assist in this work visitation committees comprising learned laymen and theologians travelled throughout saxony beginning in fifteen twenty seven the visitation was carried on in other areas of germany too and in this way the groundwork for future organization began in the meantime two distinct factions had developed among the princes of germany one espoused the roman cause and the other the reformation from fifteen twenty five to fifteen twenty nine a series of diets and assemblies was held the rival princes concerned themselves largely with attempts at and opposition to the invoking of the ban against luther his works and his cohorts which had been executed at worms at speyer in fifteen twenty nine the catholic princes with the emperor's backing tried to force a resolution preventing the spread of luther's teachings in any new areas but the reformation princes protested matters concerning salvation were of an individual nature and could not be legislated conscience bound them to oppose the resolution principles which the wittenberg monk had declared only eight years before were becoming the national mind the augsburg confession sparks of the reformation had caught fire elsewhere in europe developing into reformed mennonite anabaptist and other denominations a major purpose of the diet called by emperor charles at augsburg in fifteen thirty was to harmonize these various groups and attempt a final reconciliation with rome to this end each body was to define its teachings in a statement or confession but not all were represented at the diet and only three were actually submitted as usual the papists were laying for the lutherans they had prejudiced the emperor against a fair hearing and were reserving their best ammunition for the saxon heretics fully confident that a lutheran defeat would speedily bring down the downfall of the others still under imperial ban luther could not attend the diet but stayed at a castle in coburg from which he advised melanchthon and others appearing before the emperor 
the confession a series of twenty-eight articles setting forth the lutheran position was read on june twenty-fifth the first twenty-one present fundamental doctrines of the scriptures regarding god original sin the son of god justification the church the sacraments civil affairs the freedom of will the cause of sin good works and the worship of saints while the last seven treat of roman abuses which contradict the word of god the emperor commissioned the roman theologians to prepare a refutation on the basis of it he rejected the lutheran confession ordered church property restored to roman bishops and forbade witnessing and the printing or sale of lutheran writings dejected by their failure to reform the church the lutherans went home in the fall of fifteen thirty unaware that their confession would become a basic creed of the largest protestant body in the world threatened with coercion by the romanists in germany they joined with other protestants in fifteen thirty one to form the league of schmalkaden war was averted when the emperor listed both groups to meet the turkish invasion of austria and armed conflict over religious principles was delayed until the summer of fifteen forty six luther didn't see it a few months earlier he went to stand before the judge he had learned to love instead of fear back to eisleben the circuit of luther's life was completed in eisleben his birthplace where he had gone to mediate between the princes of mansfeld he died early on the morning of february eighteenth fifteen forty six after fervently committing himself to god's keeping and reaffirming the doctrines he had preached luther's lifetime was marked with concern concern first about himself and god it wasn't selfish a man has to find his treasure before he can share it luther had searched through lonely tormented hours in a monastery he brushed aside centuries of proud speculation until he found the truth it was written in a book the record of god's revelation of himself to man the bible from it he learned that god is love instead of wrath that no one pope or king can stand between man and that love or gain it for another that one can't even win it for himself it is god's free gift then his concern was for others this treasure was too priceless to keep he had to give it away he preached it though all the forces of evil railed against him he printed it though emperors ordered him to stop the press he sang it and helped the church to sing in tones so soft they lull a child to sleep in battle cries resounding from the ramparts of his mighty fortress god the devil prefers blockheads he said therefore the school must be the next thing to the church concern led him to teach professor was the only job he held but that for all his life he hated those who arrogantly claimed sole right to knowledge so that each might know the truth himself and in that truth be free he translated the sacred scriptures matthew to revelation first and then the old testament were translated not in high-sounding phrase or platitude but in majestic simplicity the words of hans and hilda the lords and ladies would understand it that way too the principles of faith which luther proclaimed brought fame and the promise of power but the words addressed to the nobles at forms recount the humility of his service i seek nothing beyond reforming the church in conformity with the scriptures i reserve nothing but to bear witness to the word of god alone chronology 
the following is a timeline of martin luther's life events fourteen eighty three november tenth martin luther born at eisleben fourteen eighty four family moves to mansfeld fourteen ninety seven luther goes to magdeburg school fifteen o one enters university of erfurt fifteen o five receives master of arts degree july second vows to become a monk july seventeenth enters augustinian cloister at erfurt fifteen o seven april fourth ordained to priesthood fifteen o eight teaches at wittenberg fifteen o nine lectures at university of erfurt fifteen ten november begins journey to rome fifteen eleven returns to wittenberg as professor fifteen twelve october eighteen through nineteen receives doctor of sacred scripture degree fifteen seventeen october thirty first posts ninety five theses fifteen eighteen august pope wants luther brought to rome fifteen nineteen july fourth through fourteenth luther debates with eck at leipzig fifteen twenty june fifteenth papal bull signed october tenth luther receives bull december tenth luther burns bull fifteen twenty one january twenty seventh diet of worms begins april sixteenth arrives at worms april seventeenth makes first statement april eighteenth luther will not recant april twenty sixth leaves worms may fourth arrives at the wartburg may twenty sixth banned by edict of worms fifteen twenty two march sixth returns to wittenberg fifteen twenty five june thirteenth marries katharina von Bora fifteen twenty seven composition of a mighty fortress fifteen thirty june twenty fifth augsburg confession read fifteen thirty four publishes complete bible in german fifteen forty six february eighteenth luther dies at eisleben End of Martin Luther by Carl E. Koppenhaver, read by Elise J. Wood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.